Okay, welcome back everyone. Welcome to the second lecture of CS229 machine learning. So, where were we? So, uh, in lecture one, we, we were going through uh, some of the review material, linear algebra. So, uh, and today for the, uh, for today the plan is to finish up the review of linear algebra, some of the topics we could not um, cover on Monday. Uh, review some matrix calculus or multivariable calculus and then also review some probability theory. And with that we will be finishing all the review and from the next class we are going to start uh, with actual machine learning uh, with linear regression. Okay, so uh, a quick recap. So. So we went over what a vector is and a matrix is right? and uh, we saw some of the some of the applications of linear algebra. We saw why we need to um, uh, study linear algebra for example uh, to represent uh, your data. Um, Covariance matrices, right? Kernels. You're not expected to know what a kernel is at this stage, but you know this just to um, um, name a few concepts that we'll be using later, and and also uh, in general multivariate calculus, right? Um, and then we went over some operations. Such as a vector vector operation like the inner product or the dot product, the outer product. For the inner product, we, we take two matrices of the same dimension. For an outer product, they need not be the same. And then we also um, went over some operations such as matrix vector product, um, where we saw two interpretations the dot product interpretation and the scaling interpretation. Yes, question? Is that better? Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we saw the matrix uh, vector um, operation, um, the both the dot product view and, and the scaling of the columns um, uh, interpretation. And then uh, we also covered matrix matrix uh, uh, multiplication and we saw a couple of uh, interpretations of that, the, the inner product interpretation and the outer product um, interpretation. And then uh, we reinterpreted matrices as functions or operators rather than thinking of matrices as a grid of numbers, you know think of them as an operator where they operate on a vector that you are multiplying with, think of the vector that you are multiplying a matrix with as the input and the vector that you get as the output, right. And with that function point of view, uh, function interpretation of matrices. Right. With this function uh, uh, point of view, we saw some geometrical interpretations of the subspaces, which is closely related to um, the rank and the inverse, rank, inverse, and we also covered projections. So projecting a, a vector onto a subspace essentially means finding the point on the subspace that is nearest to the vector that we are trying to project, right. Projections and we saw the, um, uh, the projection matrix. So if you are trying to project a vector V onto the columns of X, of X where X is a matrix and V is a vector, then the projection matrix is essentially X 
x transpose oh sorry x x transpose x inverse x transpose right this is a matrix so um, x is a matrix x transpose is a matrix x transpose x is a matrix its inverse is a matrix you multiply this matrix from um, x itself from the left and x transpose from the right you, you get one you know you still get a matrix so this matrix is the projection matrix and any vector you you uh, multiply it with right you, you multiply this uh, matrix with a vector you get a new vector called u and u will be the projection of v onto the subspace spanned by the columns of x right this is an important concept that we'll come back when we talk about linear regression right so that's the uh, projection and we also started talking about uh, eigenvectors eigenvectors and eigenvalues So that's where we left off eigenvectors and eigenvalues um, are those um, special vectors for square matrices uh, where the operation of the matrix on the vector does not change the angle it only rescales it by some amount right? and the eigenvalue is the ratio by which the vector gets scaled along those uh, specific directions so each eigenvector comes with a corresponding eigenvalue. The remaining vectors which are not eigenvectors are not eigenvectors in the sense they can change their uh, direction. Is there a question? Yeah. yeah. So uh, question, so the question is do the columns of x span the subspace uh, u? So um, to clarify x um, the columns of x define the subspace onto which we want to project any given vector right so x uh, the v v over here is some any given vector and we want to project it onto the the, uh, the subspace spanned by the columns of x uh, by taking x we construct this matrix you know uh, x transpose x inverted you know multiply from the left by x from the right by x transpose you get another matrix now take any vector v and multiply v by this matrix right and you get an output vector u now that u will be in the subspace spanned by the columns of x and it will be the nearest point to v such that it you know uh, uh, it's it's um, it's in the subspace and also nearest to v thank you thanks for asking that question right. yes question Uh, I'm not sure I followed your question completely. Uh, did you mean you want to add multiple, you want to consider different vectors that you want to project onto the subspace? Okay, so which is different from this V. Okay, so le let's call them X1, X2, X3. As, okay. Mm -hmm. So the question is, um, if if uh, I want to project v onto the uh, subspace spanned by the columns of x, would it be different from what we would get if we were to project v onto first column of x separately to the second column of x separately to the third column of the x and then sum those projections? Uh, the answer is no. They will not be the same. Uh, just because um, here's an example. Um, consider this to be um, x x1 um, call it x1 so this is like the first column of x uh, and let this be uh, the second column of x um, x2 now suppose uh, there is a vector v and let me um, 
the vector should ideally be out of the subspace. So, imagine there is a, 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 a vector over here, right. And now, I want to project this onto the subspace of x, right. Now, if I were to separately project it to say uh, x2 first, this might be uh, the projection, separately to x1 first, this might be the projection and I sum them up, it is going to be something here. But from here, the nearest projection is, is, is this. Right? If, if you project them separately and add them up, you do not necessarily reach the nearest point. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, question? Yes, if, if, if they are, if they are the uh, uh, orthonormal to each other, maybe, but, but x1 and x2 need not be orthonormal, they, are, they could be any, any, any vectors. I am not sure about the orthonormal, I will need to think about that, but in general, you know, it, it does not hold that you can project them separately. A any more questions? All right. Okay, so moving on. So, uh, next we are going to um, focus more on eigenvalues and, and uh, see some of, some of its uh, properties. So, um, So here is the, the picture that we started with. Um, so imagine an input space in R3 and this is your input space, right, and so this is your x axis, y axis, z axis, right. And, uh, the picture that we that we kind of uh, started with to to build our intuitions was to consider uh, a unit ball like a soccer ball that's centered around the origin of of radius one, right? And you have the matrix your your square symmetric matrix A, which is also in R three and symmetric, right? And take this shape and run it through A. Now, what does that mean? What, what does it mean to, I mean, we know how, how, how we can take a vector and run it through A and get an output vector, but what does it mean to take a shape and run it through A and get another shape? It just means take every point on the surface, separately run it through A and reconstruct the resulting shape on the other side, right? So, um, so this is our input take every point on the surface. So, this is a three-dimensional ball, you know, I am just trying to the circle, you know, it has, it is a three-dimensional um, um, ball and run it through A and we get an ellipsoid. Right? Now, uh, at this point, we are still, still talking about symmetric uh, uh, square matrices. Now, the, the, uh, the principal axes of this ellipse are the eigenvectors of A, right? So, um, the, 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 the longest axis is going to be the eigen, uh, eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue um, and that is because points along these axis on, on, the, on the input sphere will get mapped to a point along the same direction, but at a different uh, different distance from the origin, right? And the ratio of the output distance from the origin to the input distance to the origin is the eigenvalue corresponding to the eigenvector, right? Now, the product of all the eigenvalues of a matrix is also the determinant, right? So, uh, the determinant of a matrix is the product of all eigenvalues, right? So, the determinant of a matrix depends only on the eigenvalues, right? The eigenvectors do not matter. If you have another matrix which, uh, which results in a shape that is similar to this ellipsoid, it will have the same determinant even though it may be oriented differently. So, the uh, determinant is the product of all the eigenvalues and another thing that kind of um, becomes obvious here is 
the product of all the eigenvalues over here is basically the ratio of the the the, uh, the principal you know of, of this distance to this distance is one eigenvalue the ratio of this distance to this distance is another eigenvalue and so on and it so happens that the product of all the lengths of um, uh, these half diameters of, of the different axes of an ellipsoid is also the volume of the ellipsoid. Right? So, another interpretation of the determinant is it is the volume of output shape over volume of input shape. for any shape for any shape that has you know some non zero volume on the input it need not be just a, a, a sphere it could be you know a cube it could be any arbitrary shape it has some volume run that shape through the matrix a you get an output shape right and that output shape has some volume as well now the ratio of the output volume to the input volume is the determinant of the matrix now it should be obvious that if the rank of the matrix is is if it's not a full rank matrix it means one of the eigenvalues is zero which means this sphere would have collapsed into an ellipse rather than uh, retaining its ellipsoid shape and the volume of an ellipse in a three dimensional space is zero exactly right so um, what you will see is that the uh, volume of the output shape will be um, uh, for non full rank matrices right the volume of the output shape will be 0 over you know some non zero and again you know um, this is also you know uh, directly clear because it's the product of on eigenvalues one of the eigenvalues is zero so you know the volume of the output shape will also be zero any questions about this now the reason why we focus on this this uh, volume interpretation is because this is going to um, help us further down in the course, right? Uh, especially when we are are talking about talking about operations that we perform on random variables, right? Uh, this concept of determinant will become very important because even though we we uh, um, perform some kind of a linear operation on a random variable, we will then need to adjust the resulting uh, uh, random variables probability by dividing it by the determinant so that the volume of the the uh, of the pdf should still integrate to 1 so you know to maintain constant volume as you perform um, um, linear operation you you will um, you will need to divide the you know divide the output by the determinant to to uh, uh, maintain the uh, the volume um, but if if you don't you know uh, that's that's you know advanced we're going to go over that again in in a lot more detail uh, uh, for later in the course but it's it's important to kind of have this this um, this understanding of the determinant that it is it is uh, the determinant kind of tells you how much the the matrix either expands or contracts the space right if if the volume the resulting volume is is bigger it's kind of expanding and if it's if it's uh, if it's smaller then it's kind of contracting um, uh, contracting the input space Right. which also means that you know if one of the one of the uh, eigenvalues is zero it means the determinant is zero and therefore the matrix does not have an inverse right now that, that's that's you know that should also be the be kind of obvious because you take you take a soccer ball um, you, if you if you if you kind of transform it into an ellipsoid you can still map it you know one uh, map every point on the ellipsoid back to the soccer ball but if you if you kind of squash it into an ellipse then you know uh, there's no way you can map back a two dimensional space back into a three dimensional space right so there's no, there's no inverse if any one of the eigenvalues is zero okay that's it about determinants any any questions about determinants okay i'll take that as a no next moving on There is a technical term for the collection of all eigenvalues of a matrix and that is called anybody? Perspective. 
Yeah. So, so the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they're, 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 they're all uh, pretty related. So the spectrum is, uh, collection of eigenvalues of a matrix and you know you generally sort them in descending order you write the the, the largest eigenvalue first and kind of um, sort them in the in the um, in the uh, 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 descending order now uh, for most operations the spectrum of a matrix pretty much contains all the information that we care about uh, about you know the matrix for for most of the operations essentially uh, you know it tells you what is going to be the resulting shape of of uh, the ellipsoid uh, for for a given uh, in, input unit ball the orientation may be different but you know you can kind of adjust that by doing a change of basis you know to orient things differently but essentially the the um, uh, core of the operation of what a matrix does is kind of captured by the spectrum or you know the collection of um, eigenvalues and there is this um, theorem called the spectral theorem which we are not going to prove The spectral theorem which says for every square matrix um, or say d by d, every square matrix that is also symmetric, right, has real valued eigenvalues. and orthonormal eigenvectors. Right? Uh, which, which makes, you know, um, um, and this actually covers a whole lot of uh, different, different uh, matrices that we are interested in. For example, Hessians. Are square matrices and they are symmetric, right? Which means they have real valued eigenvalues. All their eigenvalues are real. Some could be zero, some could be negative, but they're all real valued. There are no complex eigenvalues. What it, that's what it means, and 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 has you know uh, orthonormal eigenvectors. Uh, Hessians covariance matrices. Right, kernel matrices. Again, we're going to see what kernels are later, but you know, ju just so that you, you know, why this is kind of uh, uh, relevant for the course, right? All these have, um, um, they are all square, they are symmetric, and therefore they have real valued eigenvalues and orthonormal uh, eigenvectors. Right? With this, next we're going to start um, something called the uh, quadratic form. quadratic forms and, and, and this is closely connected to uh, uh, um, you know our definitiveness you know positive semi-definite negative semi-definite um, and that's going to uh, uh, pop out of this. So what's a quadratic form given a matrix A assume it is a square right and you have some vector x or d the uh, quadratic form is also written as x transpose a x, right? Uh, so far we've seen a x, but x transpose a x is, is uh, also called the quadratic form. Okay. And the, the uh, quadratic form holds for any square matrix, but in general we assume whenever we are working with a quadratic form, we just assume that A is symmetric as well. And that's because for any uh, uh, quadratic form expression A where A is may or may not be symmetric, there always exists another B such that X transpose BX equals X transpose AX where B is symmetric. It's pretty easy to show you know, uh, why this is the case. Um, 
it's, 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 it's also in the notes. I don't want to spend too much time on proving this. It's a very simple proof. But in general, whenever you're dealing with quadratic forms, it is safe to assume that the matrix is, is uh, uh, symmetric just because you can always represent it as another symmetric matrix B where X transpose BX equals X transpose AX for all values of X. Okay. And, uh, and B actually happens to be just half of A plus half of A transpose. It's, it's a, you know, um, a pretty simple proof. Yes, question. What's the equation x transpose bx? Oh, it just shows that for every, for any matrix, square matrix A, there is a corresponding square matrix B, which is also symmetric, which by the way is calculated like this, such that x transpose Ax equals x transpose Bx for all x. which is why you can just assume that A is symmetric uh, because even if it's not symmetric, you can use the corresponding B in its place because their values are the same at all values of X. Right? Now, this quadratic form is used to, oh, I just didn't want that to be distracting. That's all. all right. So we use the definition, or the the uh, quadratic form, to define what's also called as definitiveness. So uh, the way we uh, define definitiveness is uh, if x transpose a x, you know, for a matrix, uh, uh, a square symmetric matrix A and any value x um, is greater than zero, you know, for all x. So this symbol means for all x. Uh, then we call the matrix A. We say A is positive definite. Similarly, if x transpose A x is greater than equal to 0 for all x, here uh, for all x not equal to 0, not equal to 0, because when x is 0, you know, uh, uh, A transpose x, uh, x transpose A x will be 0, then A is positive semi definite. is less than 0 for all x uh, uh, not equal to 0, then A is negative definite. If it is less than equal to 0 for all x not equal to 0, then A is negative semi-definite. Right? And if you cannot say uh, um, any statement about this where for some values of x it is greater than 0, some values of x it is less than 0, then we say it is just indefinite. Right? So this is, this is the definition of what is a positive semi-definite matrix or a positive definite matrix. It means take the square matrix A, you, know, you can assume it to be symmetric um, and for any value of x, for any vector x calculate x transpose ax, right? If all the, the resulting values of x transpose ax for every x that's not equal to 0, if it's greater than 0, then a is positive, def, uh, positive definite. If it's greater than it equals 0, it's positive semi-definite and so on, right? Now, let, let's, let, let's try to kind of um, 
understand this uh, geometrically what 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 does this actually mean why is this you know what what's 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 kind of what's the meaning of x transpose ax um, because you know we seem to care about its its value so much now first recall um, uh, let's go back to the dot product a transpose b where a and b are any two vectors right let's let let um, this be a this be b right uh, if the value of a transpose b uh, or if the angle between a and b is less than 90 degrees then a transpose b will be positive right um, if a and b are then a transpose b is 0 and the other one is obvious If it's more than 90 degrees, then a transpose b is less than zero. Right? Now, um, this is for any two given matrices a and b. Now, what the quadratic form uh, we see over there, you know, quadratic form. But what what it's actually doing is it instead of looking at uh, a and b, it's looking at x transpose with ax you are seeing what happens to x and you know and then you run it through a you get ax right it's 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 doing a dot product between the input and the output of a for any given uh, value of x right that's that's essentially what the quadratic form is doing and it is um, and we saw in the picture previously before let me draw it again um, this time i'll just draw it in two dimensions um, so assume this is the the, 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 the unit sphere and this is the ellipsoid that you get u to a which is r2 so this is the input input shape the input ball that we're going to run through a and this is the output that we're going to get and um, what what this is um, essentially saying is that for a positive semi definite matrix or a positive definite matrix for any value of x on the input that we take, run it through A, we get a corresponding output, right? Now the angle between these two is less than 90 degrees, right? Does that make sense? x transpose ax is greater than 0, so x is this here was input x and this was output ax right as long as their angle is less than 90 degrees it will always be greater than 0 right and this is again um, this is how we relate x trans the the uh, the definitiveness statement to eigenvectors eigenvalues because if you have a, a matrix that has all positive eigenvalues then the eigenvectors only scaled get scaled in a positive direction right and this eigenvector gets scaled you know in, the, in a positive direction and x transpose ax for eigen vectors are always positive because they are just scaled in a positive direction and and when you when you do a dot product between two vectors with which are oriented similarly it's always positive right so you kind of think of the eigen eigen vectors as you know acting as pivots and anything inside them get mapped to vectors that are also in the same quadrant right if one of the eigenvalues was negative so for example if this eigenvalue was positive but this eigenvalue was negative then a vector over here could have gotten mapped to you know to something in this quadrant which means its angle could have been bigger than uh, 90 degrees which means x transpose x could have been negative Right. If you have all positive eigenvalues, then the eigenvectors kind of act as pivots, where the vectors inside one quadrant remain in the same quadrant in the output space. Right. So, how does that connect to the um, definition of positive uh, definite uh, positive definiteness? So, uh, for a positive definite matrix, all 
eigenvalues are greater than 0, right? For a positive semi-definite matrix, they are greater than or equal to 0. For a negative definite matrix, all the eigenvalues are less than 0 and for a negative semi-definite matrix, they are less than or equal to 0. And for an indefinite matrix, they can be you know, greater than or less than 0. Right? So, the, 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 uh, the definitiveness of a matrix, which is defined by the quadratic form, has a one-to-one -one relation with the spectrum of the matrix. Any questions about that? Yes. Yeah, so um, when I say it is less than or greater than equal to 0, for a few x's it's going to be greater than 0, for a few other x's it's going to be less than 0. So if you construct any positive uh, definite matrix, where, uh, any symmetric matrix where one of the eigenvalues is positive and one of the eigenvalues is negative, you're going to get a matrix and there are going to be you know, you know, um, eigenvectors corresponding to the, uh, there are going to be vectors corresponding to the eigenvectors of that matrix which will result in, you know, the value, the, the quadratic form being greater than 0 or less than 0. Right? Any questions on this? Okay. So, next we are going to move on to um, decomposing matrices. So given a matrix, there are many ways to decompose it and what do we mean by decompose it? Decomposition, we are going to look at it right away. The two decompositions that we are going to, um, that we are going to look at today are the singular value decomposition or it is also called the SVD and the eigenvalue decomposition. Those are the two things we're going to um, uh, go over today, uh, because these are, you know, these two are, are um, probably the most um, um, uh, interesting ones from a theoretical point of view. There's another, you know, um, decomposition that's used very uh, 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 frequently called the Cholesky decomposition. Maybe we'll. Uh, um, I'll just mention in passing what what uh, that is. But the uh, interesting ones to analyze are the singular value decomposition and the eigenvalue decomposition. Right? The singular value decomposition. Um, so this is S V D. This is I'm going to call it uh, eigenvalue decomposition. Right? So. Uh, matrix A for singular mat, uh, value decomposition can be any matrix A, right? It can be any matrix whatsoever, right? But for eigenvalue decomposition, you need square matrices. Right? That's, that's uh, one main difference. And the decomposition itself is defined like this. 
So, singular value decomposition is generally we say A equals U S V transpose and eigenvalue decomposition we generally say A equals What, is, what, 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 what are we saying here basically? Basically what we are saying is given a matrix A, so let us again think of this in terms of functions, right? Uh, matrices, you know, think of matrices as functions, that is always like a, a, a useful approach. Um, what this is basically saying is Ax can also be written as U S v transpose x which means first multiply x with v transpose and you get some output uh, vector then take that vector as input to s and you get some output and take the output of multiplying by s and feed it as input to u and you get you know, some output and what it it's basically saying is the operation performed by x can be decomposed into three sub matrices which you apply like a pipeline, you know, first apply V transpose to X, um, you know, each of these is a matrix. First you apply V transpose to X, you get, you know, a different uh, a vector, you take that vector, you know, uh, feed it as input to S, you know, take the output of that, feed it as input to U, you know, it's, it's just a nested operation, right? And, and similarly, um, the eigen decomposition of, of uh, A, can be written as um, right. We saw what a matrix A uh, essentially essentially does, right? So So what the uh, singular uh, value decomposition and eigenvalue decomposition are saying is that you can decompose a matrix A into three sub matrices such that the operation performed by A on any vector x can be split into three sub parts. Right? Uh, so the operations, so before we move on to operations, let us talk a little more about these uh, individual matrices. So U and V are, they are ortho orthonormal mat matrices. And S is also called a singular, uh, the, the set of singular values, it is called, uh, uh, and this is a diagonal matrices, diagonal matrix where the singular values are along the diagonal of, of, um, of S and D is also diagonal and the eigenvalues are along the diagonal uh, of D. So the eigenvalue decomposition decomposes into U, D, U transpose where the columns of U are the eigenvectors and D is the set of eigenvalues. And um, U would, for example, if this is U and this is D, then there is a one to one mapping between the eigenvector and the corresponding eigenvalue and a different eigenvector and the corresponding eigenvalue and so on, right. The action performed by A is completely defined by its set of eigenvectors and eigenvalues for a square matrix A. And for any matrix A, you have, uh, you have a collection of singular values in place of eigenvalues. And you have a U and another matrix V transpose. For the singular value decomposition, U and V are, you know, 
they're, they're, they're different matrices in general. They are, um, um, they just need to be orthonormal, which means their unit length and all of them are orthogonal to each other. Whereas for the, the eigenvalue decomposition, the, the third matrix has to be the inverse of, of, um, the, of u itself. So this is just u inverse, right? Now, uh, we have, uh, so we can, we can, we can uh, break down the eigenvalue, the, uh, any matrix uh, into the singular value decomposition. But the cool thing about the, uh, the singular value decomposition is that you are guaranteed that the singular values of the matrix are going to be real valued, right? No matter, you know, what matrix A you, you feed in, it need not be full rank, it could be anything whatsoever any real valued matrix, you know, as long as, you know, the values in the, in the grids are all real valued, you can always come up with a decomposition of this form where the, where the U and V matrices are orthonormal and the singular values are all real. Yes, question? Okay, no question. Now, uh, however, with eigenvalue decomposition, um, things are a little different in that it is limited to square matrices only. Yes, question? Well, so uh, the question is, uh, aren't, isn't the eigenvalue decomposition diagonalizable? So if you, uh, uh, by, by diagonal, diagonalizable, if you mean diagonalizable into real valued eigen, uh, uh, eigen uh, values, then yes. But in general, you can take any square matrix and the eigenvector, uh, the eigenvalues may be complex, but you can still break down. So um, if it's not uh, uh, diagonalizable, then this is, there are going to be complex values in there. But if you're okay with, 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 with complex numbers, then you can always represent it like this. Right. So, um, yes, question. So uh, are S and uh, uh, D diagonal matrices with eigenvalues. So in the eigenvalue decomposition, it is um, um, the D matrix is diagonal with eigenvalues. In the singular value decomposition, the, the uh, S is a diagonal matrix with what's called a singular values, not the eigenvalues. Eigenvalues are only defined for square matrices. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to that, I'm coming to that, right? So this is just the way you can, you can break down a matrix into, into, uh, into subcomponents, right? Now, it's kind of interesting to see, you know, how, how these are related. Let's call this A, um, SVD, and So I'm going to call this uh, step one, step two, and step three, right? Where step one corresponds to what happens when you take the first piece and uh, and and uh, look at its action on X. Uh, step two is take the output of step one and run it through the next matrix, and step three is take the output of step two and run it through the third matrix, right? Now, U and V or U and U inverse are all orthonormal, right? Which means step one for both singular value and, and um, eigenvalue decomposition is um, here it is, it is uh, V transpose and here it is U inverse. And the action is going to be just rotation and mirroring, right? Rotation and possibly mirroring. 
In fact, it's actually going to be just just a rotation. It's not even going to be uh, mirroring because it's orthonormal, right? It's just going to be some kind of uh, a rotation, right? And then step two is you're multiplying it by a diagonal matrix, which means you're just scaling along the axes. That's what a diagonal matrix, multiplying by a diagonal matrix does, right? Take any vector, multiply it by a diagonal matrix, it, then you're taking each component and scaling that component along the corresponding axis by the value of the, the uh, uh, element in, uh, in, in, in the corresponding diagonal entry, right? So this is just scaling, no, scaling, that is scaling along the axis, along the uh, the x and y axis, not the eigen, eigen but, but scaling along the axis. Right? Now, the scaling for the singular value decomposition is always real valued, right? Uh, because s is always going to be real valued for SVD. So this is real valued scaling. But for the eigenvalue decomposition, some of your eigenvalues may be complex. And scaling by a complex value essentially means there is some amount of rotation involved, right? Scaling by uh, a, a complex number uh, means there could be rotation if eigenvalue is complex. And then step three is another rotation. Here, the step three is going to be uh, rotating it by u. So this is just rotation one, and this is rotation two. Right? Means you're, you're, we rotate in, in SVD. We rotate it, scale it along the uh, diagonals after rotating, and then rotate it by a different amount corresponding to u. Whereas with singular value decomposition, uh, with eigenvalue decomposition, first we rotate it, then scale it. But the scaling may, you know, if you have complex uh, eigenvalue, the scaling may uh, involve some implicit rotation. And then we rotate it by u, which is basically the inverse of the first step, inverse of step one. In eigenvalue decomposition, first you rotate it by u inverse, then scale it, and then undo the rotation uh, that was done by. Uh, um, yes, question. So uh, the so I would say ignore this case for now. Um, uh, this is this is uh, not very you know, uh, crucial for us. I'm happy to go deeper into that after the lecture, but. Uh, essentially, what you want to think of this, you give some shape as input, you know, uh, you can characterize what a matrix A is doing by thinking of it as first rotating it by some amount and then scale the rotated version by different amounts along, you know, the x and y axis and then rotate it by a different amount, right? And it could be, it is, it is uh, different for SVD in the sense it could be you know, arbitrarily different, but for the eigenvalue decomposition, you're gonna just undo the initial rotation, right? And what you, what, you, uh, what you see is that the the direction that ends up aligning with the axes after the first rotation are the directions of your eigenvectors, right? Because you're gonna, you're gonna scale those, the scale the points along the points along the eigenvectors after rotation will end up aligning with the x-axis. And when you scale them along the axes, these points are not changing their direction once you undo the rotation. Does that make sense? So uh, what this means, again, is that uh, for square matrices, um, especially square symmetric matrices where we don't care about complex eigenvalues, 
for all square symmetric matrices, we are we we are going to rotate the the action of A can be summarized at as rotated such that the eigenvectors align with the axes, scale it by different amounts. The scaling could be negative, which means you are kind of mirroring it, and then undo the rotation you did in the first step, right? Which means the the eigenvectors and the axes of the ellipsoid are going to be the same. Right? Now, for singular value uh, decomposition, um, there are no eigenvectors. Um, there are singular vectors, uh, but the, the uh, interpretation is, is not, not, not as easy because um, you are effectively rotating it by some amount, scaling it along the axes and not undoing the rotation, but just rotating by a different, you know, by u instead of v inverse. The, the benefit of SVD is that you always get real singular values, but with uh, eigenvalues you require the matrix uh, to be square and symmetric to get real eigenvalues, but the singular values are always real. And it so happens that if you are having square symmetric matrices in your eigenvalue, the singular value decomposition and eigenvalue decomposition will give you the same three components. So, singular value decomposition and eigenvalue decomposition are the same for square symmetric matrices. For, uh, for A arbitrary, which means it need not be square, it need not be symmetric, right? SVD is the only thing that works. So, SVD is like a sledgehammer. Throw any matrix at it, it's going to decompose it into three parts, right? Um, if A is square, you can still do SVD, but you can also do an eigenvalue decomposition. Some eigenvalues may be complex, but if you do an SVD on a square matrix which is not symmetric, you still get you know real valued singular values. And when A is square and symmetric, then SVD and eigenvalue decomposition are the same. You know you get the same uh, uh, U will be the same, S and D will be the same, V transpose and U inverse will be the same. Yes, question. So, when A is square, you can perform both the eigenvalue decomposition and the singular value decomposition, but the decomposed components may not be identical, right? But if A is square and symmetric, and you can perform both the decomposition and the components will also be the same. So, SVD and eigenvalue decomposition are, you know, it's, it's the same decomposition if it's square symmetric. And if it's non-square, Yeah, it does not even exist. I mean, it's not even defined. So, eigenvalue decomposition is defined only for square matrices. So, eigenvalue, you know, algebraically, um, the eigenvalue eigenvector is basically the solution to AX equals lambda X. Right? What it means is take a matrix A, multiply it by a vector X and you are going to get an output vector which is you know, along the direction of X but scaled by some eigenvalue. Right? And all the solutions of this are your eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Right? And in order for this to hold true, A has to be square. Right? For, for, this, for this to be, uh, uh, for the output to be a, a, scalar, a scaled version of the input, A has to be square, otherwise it is just going to be a you know, a different dimension. So, uh, eigenvalue decomposition holds only for square matrices, right? Uh, one, two, okay, next we are going to move on to matrix calculus. Any, any questions about this? Yes, question. Yeah, um, for 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 uh, it's it's you know what what you say is true in terms of in terms of the intuition. You know, you probably want to have this as you know in, in, in your mind in, for in terms of having the right intuitions. Yes, some matrices are are, are uh, you know not diagonalizable, uh, but 
for the most part we are going to be dealing only with symmetric matrices you know square symmetric matrices and we are going to be mostly dealing with with you know uh, uh, quadratic forms you know for any given in, in which case you have a corresponding symmetric matrices and in case of you know symmetric matrices you can always um, uh, uh, you can always uh, uh, decompose a, a, a square symmetric matrix matrix Yes. So the question is, um, how do we test uh, whether a given matrix is, you know, uh, belong to any one of those categories? Because we just cannot test, you know, feed in all the possible values of x and and, and see it. And um, that's a great question. And the answer is, we saw a one-to-one -one correspondence between the definitiveness and the spectrum. Which means you can always calculate the spectrum of a matrix by doing an eigen decomposition. We haven't. Um, discuss how you actually do this decomposition, right? And and we'll we'll probably see that later in the course how you can uh, uh, decompose it. But there are lots of methods to decompose a given matrix into its you know eigenvalue decomposition or singular value decomposition, and then you can just inspect the eigenvalues. Are they all positive? Are they all negative? And you know you get the corresponding definitive. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. yeah. so the, the so the question is, uh, can we swap these two uh, rows and columns and also the corresponding you know diagonals and also the corresponding rows? Yes, you can do that. Uh, but as a, as a convention, you just write them in, in in descending order. It's just a convention. Okay, so moving on to matrix calculus. Should have probably swapped. All right, so matrix calculus. Let's see. I'm assuming all of you are familiar with with calculus. You know, uh, with the concept of differentiation. Um, and as a prerequisite, you should have already seen multivariate calculus in terms of you know um, um, differentiating, say, a scalar valued function that has a vector valued input um, and such. So, uh, in fact, everything that I'm uh, covering. Today, you know, hopefully this is not your introduction to these subjects. Hopefully, you you should have already seen them, and this should be like a, a refresher, or you know, uh, just just to um, you know recollect things if you if you've forgotten them. So uh, I'll I'll be skipping over a lot of um, I'll be skipping over a lot of um, 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 precise, rigorous statements, and just giving you the intuition so that you know. You just remember things that you've already studied. So hopefully, this is not an introduction to these subjects for you. Right? So uh, matrix calculus, calculus. Right? Let's see. Let's let's look at a few functions. Right? So we write a function. Is this notation familiar to everyone? What this means is we have a function that we are going to call as f, as f. F is the name that we assign. And this is like the type signature of that function. It takes as input a real valued number and produces as output a real valued number. Right? Now, um, 
an example of this is you know x square. Take a number x, that's going to be the input. You square it, that's going to be the output, right? Real value input, real value output. And the the value of this function is real value. Right? This is just an example. Uh, the the first derivative of this function is going to have a value in also in r, right? And the second derivative is going to have a value also in r. So if you have a function that takes a real value input, real value output, for example, x square, its value is is real value, right? Its first derivative, in this case, two x, is also going to be real valued. Its second derivative, which is just two, is also going to be real value. Now, consider a function f. What does this mean? It means it is a function that we are going to call it as f. The input to the function is going to be some vector, a d-dimensional vector, right? And the output is going to be a real valued number, right? So, vector input, scalar output. And we are going to encounter a lot of functions of this kind in this course, right? And the most common one that we are going to uh, encounter is what you call as a loss function, right? We have not covered what a loss function is yet, but you know, this just, just, this just to give you a sense of what uh, is the kind of things you are going to be uh, looking at. Uh, the loss function is as a value, uh, a scalar value, right? And what is the first derivative of a vector, what's 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 the type of the first derivative of a function like this? A gradient. It's called a gradient, and the gradient is going to be in RD. Right? Right? And the second derivative of a function like this is called the Hessian. Right? And the Hessian is And the Hessian in this case, not only is it a square matrix, it is also guaranteed to be symmetric, right? And symmetric matrices are also written um, as S with just a single D because it's implied that it's D along both the dimensions because it's it's symmetric. Right? And again, further later in the course, we're also going to encounter functions of this type. Rd to Rp, where it's vector input, vector output, and and of course the dimensions are different. It, they could be the same, but in general the dimensions are different. Um, can anybody think of functions like this? Why you might use such functions in machine learning? I mean, it's it's totally fine if if uh, um, bias. So, uh, a function that takes a d-dimensional vector and outputs a p-dimensional vector, where, you know, projections. And, and uh, another uh, uh, um, a commonly used, used um, a component are going to be like a neural network layer. So, you're going to, you know, um, the way neural networks work is you, you, you transform one vector to another in, in some way. And it's uh, you know one layer of neural network can can look like this. It takes a d-dimensional vectors input and produces some other dimensional vectors as um, output. And is there a question? Yeah, yeah. Classification. You you feed a, an image as input and uh, you know output a, a vector of probabilities. Yeah, that's that's you know that totally falls into this uh, category as well. That's a good answer. And so the output here is going to be. An RP, right? And what's the first derivative of this of this kind of uh, 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 function? Going to look. Uh, what's what's the type of? It's called a Jacobian, exactly. And it's going to be R of d by p, or is it p by d? Anyway, one of the two. It's called the Jacobian. Okay. Um, 
and that is why if 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 um, if some of you are already familiar with neural networks, you're going to encounter Jacobians a lot in neural networks because you know that's how you uh, um, train them uh, by uh, evaluating the Jacobians. And uh, the second derivative for this is going to be some kind of a you know, d by p by p, some kind of a you know let's just call it a higher order tensor. No, not very interesting. Right. So, uh, we see right away that you know vectors and matrices are going to show up when you do multivariate calculus, right. And the tools that we saw above, in, uh, for example, eigenvalue decomposition can be applied to Hessians, and that is going to tell you a lot of information about the nature of the function, right. Uh, for example, if you if you take the Hessian of a function. And if the Hessian of a function is positive semi-definite at all input points x, then it means the, the function is kind of bowl shaped, it is convex, right. If you take some function and if you uh, uh, calculate its uh, Hessian and if it is negative definite or negative semi-definite, then it is kind of an inverted bowl shaped, right. And if the Hessian of a function is indefinite, which means it is neither positive definite or you know, semi definite, then it is exactly it, it has saddle points. What does a saddle point mean? It means along one axis it, it, it is you know, cup shaped and along uh, another axis it is it's kind of bowl shaped. It is like the shape of a saddle that you place on a horse. Right? It, it, it goes down along one axis and go, you know, goes up on another axis. Right? So, the, the, the connection between multivariable calculus and linear algebra is are, are very deep and, and you're going to, we're going to be using and analyzing Hessians of different loss functions to kind of characterize are they convex, which means if they are convex, you know that is good news. It means the, when you minimize the loss function, you reach a unique global minima because it, you know any bowl shaped function or you know take any bowl, there's always like a unique. Uh, global minima, whereas if, if, if a function is, is not convex or if it has you know uh, uh, saddle points, then you know optimization is, is, is a little harder, trying to minimize the loss function is going to be harder. Right? Now some examples of uh, how we actually go about calculating uh, gradients, uh, for example, if you have a function x, the gradient of the function with respect to x is written like this, this, this is the terminology that we generally use. The inverted um, uh, triangle um, is is uh, denotes the gradient symbol, and if you if you are writing your homeworks in LaTeX, then this you know to get the symbol in LaTeX you use uh, backslash nabla, um, and uh, the 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 uh, 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 subscript for nabla indicates what is the variable with respect to which you are. Um, um, taking the um, um, gradient and you know for gradients this is going to be vector valued obviously and the definition is just this. Take the um, uh, partial derivative of f with respect to x1 and evaluate it as x. So, I am going to use a red x here to indicate that this is the value that we are feeding and this is the variable with respect to which we are differentiating. X D of right. This is just the definition of a gradient, which means take every uh, uh, it, because this is uh, vector valued. You know, you can also kind of think of this as X X one X two. X D, right? And this is just a short for, short notation for for this. So the the function has multiple inputs because you're feeding in a vector of values, and the gray and its output is scalar, and the gradient is then defined as the partial derivative of f with respect to every input, evaluated at the 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 vector that you're feeding in, right? And this collection of partial derivatives is called the gradient. And the gradient also has an interpretation, which is it is the it is the direction of steepest ascent. What does that mean? If you have a, um, 
So let's assume this is x1 and this is actually you know x2 and this is f of x and a, a, a scalar valued vector input, uh, input function is going to be some surface along this you know in, in, in such a graph um, and the, the I am not good at drawing surfaces uh, but you know imagine there is some kind of a surface here um, and the height from any point up to that surface is the value of that function right it's 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 uh, similar to you know f of x except now it's it, it has you know uh, multiple uh, uh, input dimensions now along the surface um, the surface is going to have some kind of you know a shape and the gradient of the function at this input tells you the direction in which you want to move to to increase the value of the function the most right if you want to um, um, the I am just going to try to draw a surface right imagine this is some kind of a surface now if you are at this point and you want to adjust your input to a different value such that the function evaluates to a larger value then you calculate the gradient at this point it is going to give you some direction because it is a vector it is going to give point you in some direction and if you take a very small step along the direction from and from this new point if you evaluate the value of the function it should be it should be larger right it gives you like the direction in which you want to move your input such that the output value goes up right. and similarly you can also calculate the the gradient of a function that takes as a matrix as input with respect to the matrix right it that this is just a generalization of this right and this is going to be again a whole collection of of partial derivatives So, even though this is kind of uh, A is, is two dimensional, just pretend it is one long vector, kind of serialize it into one long vector, right? Calculate the partial derivatives and then reshape it back into, you know, um, uh, um, uh, a matrix. Any, any question? Yes. Yes, F is a function that takes A as input, a matrix as input and produces a scalar as output in this case. In this case we were looking at uh, f as a function where it takes a vector as input and scalar as output. Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, you know uh, A is going to be some kind of you know uh, uh, some kind of uh, um, you know A is going to have A11 a1 you know n assuming it is m by n you know a n1 till a I'm sorry m1 to a m n right so you are feeding uh, you know these many different inputs to f the output is as a scalar so take the partial derivative of the output of f with respect to a11 and you know and so on any questions about this right now um, so, so this was f from r m by n to r right and over here f was from r did I use d to r right we could also look at um, what is what is the hessian where x is again so f is from 
rd to r. Now the Hessian is going to look like this. Now instead of taking the first partial derivative, we are going to take you know two partial derivatives, which means it is going to be del square f by del x1 del x2 of x del square by del x d del x d of f of x similarly del square of del mm, x one x d del x d del x d of f of right. so, so here we take the second partial derivatives of f with respect to every input. Yes, question? Oh yeah, you're right. Thank you. X one x one x one x d x d x d and this will be a square x d x one f of x. The reason I'm 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 highlighting things in red is to tell you that uh, by performing the partial um, um, the partial derivative or two times uh, partial derivatives, you're going to end up with a function. And that function is this function for which you feed any arbitrary x as, as the input. Right? Is this clear? Good. And a few examples. So, um, now, so, so, so a few few things that you're going to be using, you know, very liberally throughout. What is the partial derivative, uh, or what's the gradient with respect to x? of b transpose x where b is some vector, some constant vector, you, you take a dot product with x and you want to calculate the, the this, this is scalar valued, b transpose x is a scalar and we want to calculate the gradient of b transpose x with respect to x where b is some constant, b, right? And why is that? We apply this directly. So by definition, this is I'm just going to write for some ith element, so partial uh, of xi of b transpose x, right? I have just applied this here, and this is going to be xi of b1 x1 plus b2 x2 plus b d x d right and when you when, when you calculate the partial derivative with respect to this all the terms except b i x i are going to cancel out um, because the rest of them are all constants with respect to i so maybe let's call this b i i x i and this is going to give you b i and this just b, right? Is this clear? The, 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 uh, the, the function is simple, but the methodology is the same for any, any arbitrarily complex function where we, the gradient is just defined as the collection of partial derivatives with respect to every input. And then you expand out the function, calculate the partial derivative with respect to the corresponding input, and and then you finally see, you know, is this a pattern that we recognize? And in this case, it happens to be just b. Otherwise, your 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 gradient is just some expression where, um, in general, it need not have you know a simple expression like this. Right? And so that's that's how we calculate gradients for simple functions. Thank you.
Okay. And similarly, you can also apply, um, just like regular calculus, you can apply the product rule. And we're going to see just one example of the product rule. So what is the uh, gradient with respect to x of x transpose ax? Right, we're going to apply the product rule as we know it. So this is going to be the gradient with respect to, um, I'm going to use two colors to, to uh, or precisely right? treat it as a product of two things and you know uh, uh, apply them uh, uh, differently and this is going to um, come out to be um, um, so here the the gradient here is um, you can think of this as gradient of X with so I forgot a transpose here. Right, so yeah, so this is going to be um, just a x b transpose a x, and this is going to be um, a transpose x. So uh, the this is going to be x times a plus a transpose, and if a is is uh, uh, symmetric, this is going to be just two a x. Right. A few more uh, matrix derivatives, which are going to be very useful. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. What's the what's the question? Oh, this is the product rule. So, for example, um, um, when you are taking um, so d by dx of f of x, g of x is equal to d by dx of f of x times g of x plus f of x times d by dx of G of x. Right, this is the product rule, and this is the multivariate version of that. You think of this as f of x and g of x. Yeah. Exactly. 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 You know, because this is when I when I when I write it as you know uh, the gradient, it's not clear to which parts I'm applying it to. Right. So the red parts are the parts that are getting differentiated. The black parts you treat them as constants. You know, just like this. I'm sorry. You could you could do that too, but you know generally you yeah you could you could you could do that too yeah you could. If you want to do that, can you put the red function out of the grid? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could you could. Right. So that's uh, you know this this is the product rule. Um, another uh, very useful um, identity that you're going to be using is going to be uh, gradient of a of the log of the determinant of A. And this looks pretty pretty nasty. So what's happening here? A is a matrix. Take the determinant of the matrix, and then you take the log of the determinant of the matrix, and you want to differentiate it with respect to A. Why would you want to do that? I mean, uh, but it, it it turns out that this is going to be a recurring um, uh, um, uh, a pattern. This is going to show up in multiple places. Um, Especially when you are you are dealing with you know Gaussian distributions and stuff. You remember the Gaussian has a determinant in 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 the, in the denominator. Anyways, but this is going to be uh, uh, it's going to show up many times in your homeworks, possibly in your exams. Um, and the the um, the answer is just a inverse, right? And the intuition is you know d by dt of or d by dx of log x is x inverse it's it's you know think of it like that 
All right, uh, we have another 20 minutes remaining. Um, let's see, I'm going to do a quick review of probability in the meantime. Uh, do you have any other questions? Yes, question. I'm sorry? This one? No, the first time. The first time? Uh, above it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, do you, do you agree with this? I mean, so this is this is just the same thing, you know, in a, in a multivariate setting. It is pretty straightforward. It's in the in the in the lecture notes. I mean, in the in the review notes that's posted online. You can go through the steps. All right. So this we're going to switch gears now and um, briefly review probability theory. Um, that was it about in terms of um, um, review of matrix calculus and linear algebra. Um, so we're going to switch gears to probability theory now, and this is going to be the last. Um, um, Last topic that we're going to review, and from next class we're going to, you know, start machine learning, and you know, with linear regression. All right. Uh, again, um, treat this as a review and not as your introduction to the subject. We are not going to teach it in the way it has to be taught to a student the first time. We're just going to review things so that it refreshes your memory. Okay. So first of all, what are the basic elements of probability theory? Right. So, in probability theory, there is um, probability is is basically the study of uncertainty about um, things that can happen randomly, right? And whenever we are talking about probability, there is always an implicit sample space. So, sample space are is is basically the set of all all outcomes that can happen, random outcomes that can happen, right? For example, if we um, your sample space can be what 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 is the sequence of um, um, coin tosses you get if you if you flip it twice right is it going to be heads heads or is it going to be heads tails is it going to be tail heads tail tails right now if if the experiment that you are performing is two coin tosses then any of these is a possible outcome right and the set of all possible outcomes are called uh, is basically called the sample space. Okay. Now, um, the thing that we assign probabilities to are called events. Right? An event is a subset of the sample space. Right? Uh, you want to think of, um, let's see, an event is, is a subset of, of um, the uh, uh, sample space and in this case, you know, for example, if A is, is, is some, some event uh, where it, it includes you know, heads, heads and heads, tails. Uh, basically, we are saying we are interested in the event that the first coin toss turns out to be a, a heads. Right? And the full, the entire probability uh, sample space is also an event, which means we are interested in you know, anything that happens, though it's not very interesting. Right? So that's, that's the event space, the set of all possible subsets of your sample space. Okay? And now if your sample space is, is finite, the, the event space is basically the power set, which means the set of all subsets is, is the um, event space. And then we assign something called as a probability measure. Now the probability measure takes as input an event, not an outcome, an event, and assigns it a value between 0 and 1. Right? That's, that's, that's something you want to um, um, uh, keep in mind that we don't assign probabilities to outcomes, but we actually assign probabilities to events. In the case of finite, um, finite sample space, the distinction is, is, is moot um, because you can always create a subset that has, only one, um, that has only one event and assign a probability to that subset. Uh, but when we you know, move on to uh, 
continuous spaced uh, uh, or continuous valued uh, samples then you know the distinction became becomes uh, more relevant now the, the 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 three main axioms or the three axioms of probability are that the probability assigned to an event is always greater than or equal to zero for all events again the, we're not talking about outcomes we're talking about events events are are sets of outcomes or you know subset of of the sample space the probability assigned to the entire event space or, or, or the entire sample space is always one which means some event or the other in, from the sample space will always occur right and if you take disjoint events where the, the, the intersection between any two events are is the null set then the probability assigned to the union of the of, of those disjoint events is equal to just the sum of the individual probabilities right all, all very intuitive there there's, there's nothing uh, fancy happening here then uh, conditional probability um, let b be an event such that the probability of b is not zero again b is an event not an outcome which means it's we're talking about sets of um, uh, uh, outcomes uh, and probability of a given b is is this is just the definition uh, it's the probability assigned to the intersection of a and b uh, so the intersection of a and b is also a set and therefore also an event uh, so it's the event of a intersection b divided by the probability of uh, uh, the event of b now uh, a and b are independent so the inverted t symbol means independent if the probability of a intersection b is the same as the probability of a times the probability of b right and uh, to to i mean it, th this should this should make sense right a intersection b is always going to be a subset of a or a subset of b and probability of a and probability of b are you know values between 0 and 1 and when you multiply two numbers that are you know are smaller than the one then you're going to get a value which is you know even even smaller um, again uh, probability of uh, uh, a and b are independent events if and only if probability of a given b um, is is equal to the probability of a which means the probability of a does not change whether b occurred or not So you, 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 then A and B are independent. Now random variables. Now consider um, um, an event where you know the experiment is say 10, 10 coin tosses, and you know this is one such event. Now a random variable is a function that maps outcomes to real values. Now we are not talking about events; we are talking about outcomes. You know the 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 um, the atoms of of, of um, uh, what happens in in uh, um, a random uh, as a random occurrence right a random variable is a mapping from outcomes to real values this, this is just an example of uh, 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 a random variable here where given an outcome you know that sequence of heads and tails the function just counts the number of heads in it you know that's that's just a function and you know the, the output is is a real value so it, it it's kind of useful to uh, think about it like this um, i'm going i'm going to I'm going to call this the the uh, uh, outcome space, and this to be the real line, right? Now, the outcome space has you know lots of different actual outcomes, and then on top of these outcomes, we define events, right? And events could be overlapping. And a random variable is a function that maps outcomes to real values. And here, this is you know this is a straight line, which we, which means to say you know it's you know this is just the real line. And I intentionally draw the outcome space with a wiggly line because this is just a bag of things that happen. There is no natural order among these, right? So if if you if you take a die, uh, which is colored, for example, without the numbers one to three on it, and you roll the die some color is going to show up right and you can think of those as the different outcomes where colors are not ordered but then you can define a random variable which maps each side of the die to a number for example you, you number them one two three you know that's essentially you're defining a random variable where you're now mapping the random events to the real line right so 
you know this could be a random variable a random variable is a function you know it's a it's a very poorly chosen name a random variable is neither random neither is it a variable it's just a function it's a function that maps outcomes to real values i mean it's it's um, it's just like computer science it's just a horrible name it's not about computers it's not a science but you still call it computer science right so um the, a random variable is neither random nor uh, is it a variable it's just a function that maps outcomes to to the real line right however we assign probabilities to events right we don't assign probabilities to outcomes but we assign probabilities to events and the reason why we 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 kind of um interested in random uh, random variables is because uh, by defining a random variable we are now kind of uh, bringing any experiment into a level playing field you know you map them into the real line and you start the rest of your analysis starting with the real line right you're kind of abstracting away what the specific details of the random event are just map them all to the real line and now you know you can you can have like a unified theory of of what you can you know um, do with you know uh, random things happening on the real line right so uh, by uh, uh, value of x we mean you know the set of all values that x can x can take so in this case you know uh, this random variable can take any of these values and if it's a discrete random variable then your function will look like this each thing gets mapped to a different number each outcome gets mapped to a different number right and this is going to be a discrete random variable right and the val val x of that would be you know a different values the random value can uh, uh, random variable can take right and then we have something called the cumulative distribution function now the the as i said uh, earlier um probabilities are defined on events and that probability is being defined in this space onto events now the cumulative distribution function is trying to map you know um these probabilities to probabilities along along the real value right um the definition of the cdf is fx of x is equal to the probability that x is less than x and what this actually means is you know what 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 does actually mean it means the probability assigned to the set of all outcomes omega such that x of omega is less than maybe let me call this t just less than t right what does it mean so look at your random variable there is some choose a t and get the set of all omegas such that x of t x x of omega is less than t right so in this case it is this one this one this one and create a set out of those uh, 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 create a set out of uh, create an event out of those outcomes and measure the probability on that event because we always measure probability in in the in, in the sample space or, or or the event space right and we pretend that the cdf is measuring probabilities on the real line but actually what it does is we map it back find the pre image uh, corresponding to um, um corresponding to the, the 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 set we are interested in, and measure the probability in the in the event space right and the cdf looks like this um a cdf looks like this because uh the the picture that we that we see is is you know you know you got to flip it over you know here we are mapping from the the uh, ev- uh, outcomes to the real line but over here you know um once we are once we are kind of uh, comfortable with this agreement you know moving forward we start with the real line as as as, a, as our basis and define probabilities there Mm-hmm. yeah so omega is the sequence of heads tails you know the, the the long sequence is omega it's just a string of heads tails whatever and then given that as an input you can count the number of heads in it 
and the function that takes the string as input and returns the number as output is, is the random variable. Right? And then you have discrete versus continuous random variables. Um, we went through this again uh, already. Um, I'm just going to skip over these. And uh, the, the way we uh, um, calculate the, the so, so the, the CDF is defined this way, right? And the CDF is essentially gives you, you know, uh, it, 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 it kind of decouples you from the event space and allows you to only think about, you know, the, 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 the real line. And once we define a random variable, you know, we, we forget what the event space was, what the outcome space was, and, and only deal with the real line. And so the, um, the CDF tells you what is the probability that the uh, that uh, uh, your random variable is less than or equal to some value t and the height of the cdf is um, 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 gives you that that value and the cdf is always between 0 and 1 right the, the, the at minus infinity the cdf is 0 at plus infinity the cdf reaches 1 And the probability mass function is, is defined for discrete random variables where there is a probability assigned to, an, to um, a given number. So a probability mass function would look, would look like this. This is r, then at 0 you have some height, where the height describes the probability assigned. Right? And again, all of these will be between 0 and, zero and 1. And the sum of all these heights should add up to one. Right? That's a probability mass function. Similarly, if it's a, a, a continuous value, then you have a probability density function. And the probability density function is basically the derivative of the probability uh, uh, cumulative uh, 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 cumulative density function or the CDF. Expected value. So this is probably um, the most important concept that we're going to uh, encounter and I'm just going to finish expectation and then we can break for the day. So what's the expected value? The definition of expected value uh, is like this. So let g be a function from r to r which means let's assume g you know this is some function g and this is r and this is r and the expectation of g of x now if the input that we feed to g is a random variable which means the the actual event that can get fed is, is random, uh, that get fed as input as random, then the expectation of g of x is defined like this. For, you know, um, the sum over every possible um, x that can be fed as input, evaluate g at, for that input, multiplied by the probability that that x can get fed according to the random variable. And if x is continuous, then it is the integral. Now, one way to think of it is like this. If this defines, if, if, if your x that you're feeding to g is random, then your g of x, or, or your x has some kind of a probability density. Right? So this is, this is x. This is the PDF of x, the probability density function. And this is g of x, right? Now, what the expectation is, is telling you is if you were to sample your x's according to this density, if you randomly sample x's according to this density, and then for each of those samples, evaluate g of x, and then kind of average them, you know, and take the average over here, it's going to be some some value and this is expectation of g of x which means if you're if you're sampling x's according to the random variable x 
evaluating G on those sample inputs, what is the average value of G you would get if you were to repeat this experiment you know, indefinitely long, right? What is the expected value of the output of G if your inputs are sampled according to X? So that is that's, um, um, the expectation of G of X. And this procedure of calculating the uh, expectation, so the analytical uh, uh, definition is here, that is the integral of G of X f of x um, dx. The, um, the other uh, interpretation of this is to um, take the average 1 over n g of sum over i equals 1 to n g of x i, where x i are random samples that you, that you uh, uh, random samples of x that is the input drawn according to the density evaluate it at g of x and take the average, right. And what we basically know is that the limit of this as n tends to infinity, which means the, if, if, if you perform this procedure with larger and larger number of samples, the limit of this tends to the integral of infinity g of x and uh, p of x dx, where p of x is the probability density, g of x is the function that we are uh, trying to calculate expectation over. And this, this statement is also called the, anybody? This is called the law of large numbers. Large numbers, right, super important. And this estimate of the expectation, you know, uh, so this, this is an approximate estimate of the expectation, which the, where the, the approximation gets better and better as you increase the number of n and this estimate is also called the, anybody? It is called the Monte Carlo estimate. Right? I am sorry? Monte Carlo estimate. Right? This is the Monte Carlo estimate and as you, as you increase n to infinity, your Monte Carlo estimate becomes the true expectation and that's that's basically a, a consequence of the law of large numbers and we are going to be seeing the monte carlo estimates for various you know um, uh, for various purposes in in machine learning and and in this course as well